it's really my honor and my, my great pleasure to introduce our guest today, uh, a real icon of the music industry. Sorry, I don't mean to embarrass you, but uh, a legendary record producer with over 35 gold and platinum records to his credit, label executive, talent scout, four-time Grammy Award winner. Please five. give five, five. <laughs> I can't keep up. The hits keep coming. Please, everybody, give a very, very warm welcome to Tommy LaPuma. <laughs> Tommy, thanks so much for coming. Oh, it's my pleasure, Phil. So um, I want to start back at the beginning, uh, which is uh, your early days. And you started out in the music business as a musician. And what you played saxophone, I was correct? A tenor player, yeah. Um, can you tell us how you first got excited about music? I think when you were a child, you had a, an illness that kept you bedridden, and you right. discovered, was it uh, through WJMO in it Cleveland? Was an R and B station, yeah. That, that uh, I mean, I was even before that. I was obviously, you know, into what was then happening, the big bands, and and, and uh, you know, and Artie Shaw and. All of the, you know, Benny Goodman and so forth. I was never really that much into Benny Goodman. I liked Artie Shaw a lot better than Benny Goodman. But, uh, you know, in pop, the pop music of that day, Joe Stafford and Mills Brothers and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But then it was actually when I came down with his illness when I was about nine, and I was bedridden for about, well, off and on for two or three years. Wow. Uh, I, you know, the radio was my friend. And, um, and just going through the dials, I found this R&B station. And that's when I first started hearing, like, you know, Louis Jordan and uh, Charles Brown. And I just, you know, was just taken by it. It was like, uh, uh, it was like sort of finding church, you know. You just sort of suddenly realized, wait, this, this is something, this is special. But like many parents, uh, yours were not too keen on you getting into the music business. What was your father's oh, no. plan for you? Well, you know, he, they, it was basically, you know, you had to make a living. You, you were going to get married. You know, it was just a given. You were going to get married, have children, and you were going to, you know, you had to make a living. So, uh, and I was like, you know, I don't think they knew what ADD was in those days. And I, I never was able to like concentrate on anything but music. Music was like everything, so that was something I never had a problem in having any sort of concentration with. But anything else, it was like my mind was constantly going in eight directions. And uh, and I never, you know, school was never something that I I never felt anything. There, was no, there wasn't any one, I think, that I ever met in, uh, at this school, a teacher that inspired me beyond just, you know, wanting to get it over with, quite frankly. So, uh, and then I started, and then I actually, as it turns out, there was a, a music teacher when I, uh, when I got back into school, I was like a few years behind because I, I, I'd been out for three years. So I was like two years behind. And that, that was difficult, too, because I was with kids that were younger, and particularly when you were you know, elementary, junior high, two years made a big difference. And um, so uh, I, as it turns out, when I got into junior high, and, and already when I started junior high, I basically had maybe one, if I would have been in my normal class, I would have had like maybe one more year of junior high and then I would have gone into high school. But uh, there was a great music teacher. He was a trombone player. And he, uh, I don't know, he just sort of, took, he knew that I was really interested in music. And, and in those, it's the other thing that was great about, you know, growing up in the 40, late 40s and 50s, is that, uh, you know, they, he just said, hey, you know, uh, do you want to play? Well, it'd be, prior to me getting ill, I had played a little piano. I started piano lessons. But then I, I didn't continue them uh, uh, once I, 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 I recovered. So he said, uh, what would you like to play? And for some reason or other, I was drawn to uh, the saxophone. Tenor? Tenor. And, uh, and he... Got some tenor players in here, <laughs> yes. And he, uh, 
he said, well, hey, you know, in those days they had instruments right there, you know. And band like, class and everything. Band class and like, you know, so like he said, take, pick, what do you want to play, you know. So I picked up the tenor and, and, and within a year I was, well, let's say by the time I was 16, and I was at 16, I was actually in like ninth grade. I, I should have been in 11th, ninth grade. But I was playing well enough where I started gigging. You were professional already. I was, I was playing weekends, you know. And my father, who was a barber, he, uh, you know, when he started seeing me coming home with like, you know, 15 bucks for a gig, I mean, you know, he'd worked all day for $15. And he couldn't believe it. I could work two, three hours and, and make, make the same amount of money. So he, he didn't think that it could be a profession. He used to say to me, and you know, he spoke with this great Sicilian broken English. He said, "Music, she's a good, but you got to have a trade." <laughs> so uh, you know. I, so what ended up happening was to cut a, to cut to the chase. I ended up. I had a gig, and there was a concert, and uh, that the school was having, and I was part of the orchestra, and I didn't show up for the gig. So it was, I must have been the first one to get an F in music, you know. <laughs> and I, I really went, to, and, and, uh, and so what ended up happening, in 54, I, I, I was supposed to graduate. All the kids that I was hanging out with, they all graduated. I said, man, I, I, you know, I, and I had a perfect way of getting out, which was if I would have gone to barber college, I could quit school. So that's what I did. I quit school. I went to barber college. You went to barber college. And, well. How was that? Not great. You know, because basically what you had to do is like you'd have uh, vagrants and so, so forth come in and you'd really? cut their hair, sh give them shaves. Wow. You know, uh, and, and that's how you learned, you know. And wow. you had to get like 1,200 hours. Wow. So uh, that's a I lot was. Of bums uh, haircuts. And, and actually, he started me in barber college. He just, he wanted to make sure I had a trade. So he started before I quit school. He had, by the time I quit school, I had had maybe 500 hours I had from going throughout a year or a year and a half after school. So uh, graduated, and I was working at his shop for a, a bit, and then he got me a job, and it was in the Steel District in Cleveland. So it was just, you know, I, I mean, within about, I'd say, six months, I realized, man, I really screwed up here. I made a mistake. But of course, it was too, la too late. And it wasn't like I had any, you know, my parents weren't, weren't the type where say you had need an education or whatever. They were first generation, not first generation, I'm sorry, they were immigrants who had come from Sicily. And, and to them, it was, they were hard working people. Right. And uh, so, uh, but as fate would have it, I ended up, there was a friend of mine who uh, worked at an insurance agency in the downtown area of Cleveland, it was in the Playhouse Square area of Cleveland. And, and uh, he said, you know, there's a barber shop for sale. And it turns out, cut to the chase again. I'm, Bought the shop, borrowed the money from my father at interest, uh, and uh, uh, you know he was teaching me that yeah. nobody gives you the art of the deal, nothing. right? Yeah. So, uh, uh, but it turns out that all of the radio stations were in that area, and next thing you know, I started getting disc jockeys and coming up as customers, and then they started bringing in people who were working for record distributors. And they started talking about the record business. And of course, I was a huge record freak at that point. I'd spend every dime I had on records. At know. the record rendezvous. At the, at the, they used to call it Alan Freed, who was the moon dog. Some of you know Alan Freed. Did people know about Alan Freed, early uh, FM legendary DJ? Anyway. He, was the, he was the moon dog. And he, he would uh, come out at 10 o'clock at night and play all these great rhythm blues records. And um, uh, so. I said, man, this, is, this sounds like a business I, I want to get into. And uh, nobody took me seriously at that point, and I ended up getting a chance to go on the road with a band. What was the band? It was just a, a, a lounge band, you know? It was, it was no, no big deal. But we, were, we worked every toilet in the U.S., you know, from Fargo, North Dakota, Minot, Mishawaki, Indiana, Streeter, Illinois. I mean, it was just... And after about a year, year and a half, I said, no, this, this ain't it. Not for so you. I the life on back, the road. Right. I came back and I thought, okay, I'll get back into business. I lasted one day, and I said, no, man, I can't do this. So I quit. My father flipped. He couldn't believe it. I said, how could you quit a job? You know, how could you quit? I said, I don't care. I don't care. If I'm a beach bum. I'm just, 
This isn't it. And again, as fate would have it, one of my customers had taken over as a manager of a record distributor. And he called me and he said, look, I don't have much to offer you, but I know how bad you want to get in the business. If you want to take this job, 50 bucks a week, and you pack records, pack records and you know, orders, like guys would sell records and then yeah, to bring shops. the orders in. And, yeah. and that's what I did. First five months, I just packed record orders. In the back room. In the back room. But it was a great lesson because I, I, you know, you'd hear things on the radio, and next thing you know, it was a hit. Next thing you know, you start getting orders for these things. Right. And you got a sense as to what was selling, what wasn't selling. And, and then, of course, I had, I was able to, any records I wanted, and of course they had the Riverside catalog, so I was like, <laughs> I was in heaven, you know? So, uh, uh, and then at one point he, he said, you know, I want to I want to give you a promotion here. What was, the guy's, you, what was the guy's name? His name was Jack Braytell. He, he was a sweet guy. He's gone. But um, anyway, he gave me a job as a promotion man, which was that you had to go out in those days. Radio was king, and you had to get a record on the radio in order for it to sell if it had the legs to sell. So, uh, but I took to that like a duck to water. I mean, I, I loved it and, you know, taking disc jockeys out to lunch, dinner, and, uh, and within a year, I, I, I really did well and they heard about me at this company in LA, Liberty Records, and they wanted to hire me to come out to LA. And so that was, that was it. And when I took that gig, and again, by that time, I was making like $125 a week. And they offered me a job for $125 a week, but I had to go 3,000 miles. And I took it. You know, and my father said, what are you, out of your mind? You're going 3,000 miles? You're making the same money you're making here? I said, I just want to go there. And, uh, and I had seen this stupid movie. It was, like a, it, was like a soap, it was like a soap opera movie with Kirk Douglas and Kim Novak, it was called Strangers When We Meet, but it had all of this great landscape of L.A. And I thought, shit, this is where I want to be. Looks man. good. This is great. So I took the gig and I went out to L.A. Well, unbeknownst to me, it was the greatest time that I could have ever been in Los Angeles. What, year was, what year was this? 19, well, it's 60 is when I got in the record business, so 61 I went out, went out to L.A. Now... Between 61 to, I mean, 64, 65 is like there was an ex this explosion. But I was there when all of this was happening. You know, it was like, the, it was the best, it was, I couldn't have, if I would have planned it, I couldn't have planned it better. And uh, before we, because this is when the story probably gets super interesting, but I want to ask you first, so saxophone just fell by the wayside? You didn't play anymore? Yeah, I, uh, I, I brought my, my ex, I brought my horn with me out there, but I, I was so, in, I, mean, I was so involved, and I knew that I had to work. You know, like as a promotion man, you'd have to meet the guy who worked from six to nine. You'd have to have breakfast with him at nine. Then you know you'd have lunch with the guy that got off at twelve. Then you know you'd have coffee with the guy that got off at, 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 at three. It was so you were constantly working, and I, I just, you know, I got to the point where. I think about six, eight months later, I went to pick my horn up, and my armature was so, I couldn't, you know, it was, it was gone. Not I got, happening. I got discouraged, and it was stupid, because as I think about it now, actually, I did go out, and I bought a, I found a, I had a super, I, I had a King Super 20. That's what I, that was the last horn I had, and it was, stu when we moved to New York from L.A., somebody copped it. I, I, I have no idea, but it didn't show up with everything else. So, but I found one. Yeah. So I do have a Super 20, and I, I picked it up, and I, I play a little bit, you know, but, uh, you know, I just, uh, there's a lot I forgot, you know? Well, at any rate, you clearly found the proper niche for yourself in the, <laughs> in the music. That's well, that was the, the other thing, too, man. It's like, you know, you looked around, and I had all these great things, all these great players. I, I wasn't in that league. So, oh, that, so you, you realized that well, wasn't... Well, yeah, I mean, I was, I was good. I, I could play, and I knew how to read. And, of course, that, all of that came in very handy because, you know, I can read a score. I can... I, I can't say I'm the best sight reader, but I know how to read. So I could follow a score. I could follow a, a chart, and that came in handy. 
So you get out to LA, it's the right at the, the peak of this really exciting time, and you, you fell in right away with uh, some of the musicians who would later be known as the Wrecking Crew, is that, is that right. right? And Tommy right. Tedesco, and Leon, Russell. and Leon Russell, and all those kind of people. These were guys, like, Leon was one of the first guys I met when I, when I went to LA. He was, uh, he was working this little club called Pandora's Box. And uh, the band was like, and I, they had all just come, well, most of them had just come from Tulsa. Right, from and, Oklahoma. And the band was, it was Leon, David Gates from Brett, he was playing guitar. Carl Radel, who, who ended up with, uh, 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 who's that, uh, with uh, Clapton's band. Eric, Derek and the Dominoes, he was mm -hmm. the bass player with Derek and the Dominoes. I don't know if it was Jim Kellner on drums, I can't remember now. Could have been Keltner. But, um, I mean, all these guys, not only that, but if we want to jump, what ended up happening was I met Herb Albert and Jerry Moss. Jerry Moss, I go, it's the, the, uh, the A&M, the yeah. Albert Moss is A&M. And I met these, I mean, they, Jerry was a promotion man, so I met him and we became tight. So when they started the record company, by 65, I had, over, by that time I had started I got into publishing and I was making demos and things and just getting my feet wet a little bit, you know? And in fact, one of the earliest demos you made was for the then unknown Randy Newman. Isn't that well, right? Randy, well, Randy was one of the first people I, I met because he was friends with Lenny Warrenker, who ended up becoming president of Warner's. And Lenny's father was chairman of the record company I worked for, Liberty. So I met him, both of them that were just graduating. Lenny graduated from USC and Randy had uh, just graduated from UCLA. And Randy was just starting to write, so I was, at, by this time I had gotten into publishing and I was a song plugger. And we'd make demos of all the tunes, do, you know. Do people know what song pluggers are here? Anybody not know? You know, it's funny Will because... you explain that to them? A song plugger is someone who would, I mean, you'd go to the A&R men who worked at different record companies with the songs that that your writers wrote, and you tried to get their artists to record the songs. And also, you had like catalog. Like you know, I ended up with this outrageous catalog with all these these New Orleans. You know, I had I had stuff with Fats Domino, and I had uh, uh, the Neville Brothers, and so I had a lot of catalog stuff that I was able to play these people too. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, it got to a point where I realized what I really wanted to do was produce. How did you, how did you figure that out? I, well, I, you know, just going in and making demos, uh, uh, that part was exciting. But then I used to hang out. There, was, there were a couple of A&R men that worked for uh, Liberty, Snuff Garrett being one of them. And he let me just hang out at the studio, and I would just sit in the back, keep my mouth shut, and watch what was happening, you know? And if somebody would say, gee, I can use a cup of coffee, I'd listen, boom, I'd, go, I'd get coffee, and I made myself, uh, uh, useful. let's say, well, useful, and like, they didn't mind having me around. Yeah, unobtrusively helpful. And here was the thing that really killed me, was that like, at one point, I'm sitting there, and the second engineer, I looked, I said, man, this guy looks familiar. Where do I know him from? Well, it turns out it was Bill Perkins, the you know, great tenor player who played with Stank. And, he, and I thought, man, I can't believe it. This guy, he, he wanted to become an engineer. So he was like working as a second. And then, you know, Bud Shank was like, uh, you know, one of the regular players who would come in and play. And uh, Victor Feldman, uh, you know, great vibe keyboard player. Mm -hmm. These were all this session guys. Uh, and this uh, was still uh, with Liberty Imperial Records. Yeah, but I was just like sitting at the back and these guys would show up and they'd, you know, I'd say, Why, that's Bud Shank, man. That's, uh, and it was just unbelievable, you know, that like uh, I was, all of my heroes were there. So at one point, I, I, asked, uh, uh, I asked the guy that was running the company, I said, look, I really want to get into publish, and into, into producing. And I was very tired of, the guy that I was working for had gone on to become an A&R man at Columbia, and the guy that came in there I just didn't get along with. And I was about ready to leave, go somewhere else, and the guy, thank God, this guy, Phil Scaff, he said, uh, what do you want to do? What would you like to do? I said, I'd really like to become a producer. He said, you got it, go ahead. 
So suddenly, there's your big break. I was that was a, a break, my first break, and as it turns out, we had just signed, uh, we had just bought Imperial Records and Travis Music, and all. This was the publishing company now. Along with it came this unknown group called the OJ's. <laughs> The OJs. And, uh, so you had to travel 3,000 miles to L.A. to work with a group right, from they Cleveland. Boys, they, yeah. they came from Cleveland. So, so, but we became good friends, uh, you know, uh, uh, Eddie and Walter particularly. And uh, uh, I found this song that, as it turns out, in fact, I was just with Alan Toussaint uh, about a, a month or two ago. turns out I didn't even know it. He had written Lipstick Traces. Because, but it said Naomi Neville as the writer. Well, that was his mother. Oh. He was putting everything in his mother's name because he, he didn't, he had a deal with someone else and, and they were taking all the bread and he didn't want that. So <laughs> he put it in his mother's name. And uh, so, and it was a perfect song. So that was the first thing I did. Turns out it became a regional hit. And so the first thing out of the box, I, I thought I had, you know, I don't know, hey. sold about 75,000 records or something. but. It was a start, and then at that point, Herb and Jerry at A&M had gotten to the point where they were really doing well, and they asked me to join them. But to go back to the first record I did, actually the first record I did was not the OJs. The first record I did was an instrumental record. The Tommy with Tedesco. Tommy Tedesco record. Right. And so I'm, I, I could hire anybody I want, man. So I get like a, a, a oh man, I just went blank on his name. Great drummer from uh, from New Orleans, uh, uh, of the African American cat, lovely player. I can't. I just went blank. If I think of it, I'll bring it up. So I, you know, him. Okay, I'll get you know so and so. Well, I had all of these guys who I loved, who were my heroes on this date, and I was so nervous that I wasn't concentrating. Right, and it turns out that the engineer was Bones Howe, who was, who was a great engineer, and he, he turned out to be a great producer. He was, Produced uh, uh, Tom Waits, and uh, 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 he he had engineered actually the Mamas and Papas and all that stuff. But he was the engineer. He was the engineer, and so the you know as they refer to in the business when somebody makes a mistake, clams they call them. Well, all these clams are going by, and I'm I'm so I wasn't catching on. And at one point, <laughs> Bones hit the talk back, and he said to the musicians, he said, "Okay, guys, we're on the honor system today." <laughs> And it was like the best thing he could have done because it really shook me up. And I thought, man, I got to pay attention. Yeah, this is important. I mean, you got to be so concentrated on what's going on in the room. In fact, what I ended up doing after about ten years, maybe not even that long, I found myself one day trying to explain something, and I wanted to go out to the room. And I asked the second, I said, "Do me a favor, give me some earphones." And I went out there with the music, and I was like telling them whatever that I had in mind. And then we, we did a take, and it turns out it, it was, you know, the take came out great. And then I thought, man, this has been the problem. The problem was for me is I had a difficulty communicating with that glass between me. Because, you know, when they say, what do you think of that, or whatever it is, you'd hit the talk back and things would go silent. Right. And it was just... I, did, I wasn't comfortable with it. But being in the room with the musicians, I found myself, I just was much more comfortable. And the, the, the guys didn't mind me being in the room, so, and that's the way I make records. Ever now. since then? Yeah. So I'm going to ask, a, 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 maybe it's an obvious question, but what does a producer do? Oh, that's a difficult question for, for a few reasons. Because every project, every artist, every musician, it's all different, every different. And not only is it different for every artist or every you know, project that you do, but then every album that you do with the same artist is going to be different. No two dates or days are the same. It's like, you know, everybody wakes up the, that day with a, in a different frame of mind, and you just have to like sort of be a combination of, you know, you have to know the music. Well, in those Particularly in those days, this was prior to where you had writers and artists, and 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 uh, you know, so you would basically the A and R stood for artists and repertoire. So basically, what the A and R person did was they signed the artist, they picked the repertoire, 
And that's where that expression came so from. So they picked the material that the artist would perform. Right, right. And um, so depending on, in fact, as it turns out, when I went to A&M, one of the reasons why I left A&M was because I was getting pigeonholed. I had done this record. You know, in those days when you were an A&R man, you were staff A&R man, and they would sign acts, and they would just say, hey, we just signed so-and-so, and they'd give them to you, and you'd have to, you know, this is it. Figure something out. Figure something out. Well, they had signed this group, which, you know, everything. The best thing they did was they sang in six languages. Otherwise, I mean, they could sing in tune and all of that, but, I mean, there was absolutely no creativity. There was nothing there. And I had heard this song that Pete Seeger wrote. I heard this was a Pete Seeger record. It was called Guantanamera. And I thought, man, they, they speak Spanish. They could do this. So I, I, uh, I said, OK, we're going to do this tune. And so this is another very important thing to put in your, uh, in your notebook. Pre-production, very important. Just have, you got to be, you have to be prepared. Before you know, the session? Before the date. You got to know exactly what it is you're doing. So, I mean, that's, that's to me, pre-production is more important than, well, it's, more, it's as important as any other aspect to it. And there are numerous aspects to, that goes into making a, a record. So, so uh, what I did was I, I started seeing if there were other uh, records that uh, of Guantanamo. Well, it turns out that the Weavers had done a, a version. Of Pete Seeger was part of the Weavers, and the hook, and that's when it ended up. I used it because it was so perfect. Is in the middle of Guantanamo, there's a uh, a recitation mm -hmm. where he says, "You know, I'm a peaceful man from the land of the palm trees," and blah, blah, blah. And what the Weavers did was, while Pete Seeger was saying the recitation, Ronnie, who was the, the, the girl singer with, with the Weavers, she was singing the verse. She was going, but it created a mood, you know? And it was just, so that was what we would in those days call a hook. And uh, I thought, man, I'm, I'm, this, is, this is a great idea. So I incorporated it into it. Well, it turns out the group, we changed their names, and they were the Sandpipers. And it was my first hit record. It sold two million records. It was, it was big. But I started getting uh, sort of pigeonholed. I was doing the Sandpipers. Next thing I know, I was doing Chris Montez. Next thing I was doing, like, Claude Longer. And I was saying, oh, man, this is a drag. I don't want to, you know. One thing, I'm getting uh, uh, experience right. and all of that. But that's not what I want to do. I want to work. I wanted to work with creative, creative people. Yeah. So I had a friend who who had uh, uh, had been talking about, hey man, we ought to start a record company. So uh, and I had this dream gig, you know, with A and M, and I was, I was close pals with the owners. But um, I said, man, I'm going to do this. So I just quit, and I went and I started this record company called Blue Thumb. That was in 1969. 69, right. 68 is when uh, we, we started putting it together, but I was still working for a and I hadn't joined them yet. In 69, I joined them. And we had, like, Captain Beefheart, and we had, we had, it was just incredible, man. National we, Lampoon, you National had comedy Lampoon, records. Jazz Crusaders. Uh, 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 you had a uh, W.C. Fields w, record. Uh, yeah, that was the first record we put and, out. And, uh, yeah, and Joao Donato, Dave Mason, right, right. Gabor Zabo, Dan Hicks. I mean, just all over the place. Yeah. Well, it, it Barbara listen, Streisand. My taste. Well, no, Streisand was on Columbia, but I did it. I did it. No, it was on Blue Thumb. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. We, Sorry. That would have been. That would have done it. We would have been. In, you would have. But been, uh, as it turns out, because I was an owner of the company, I was able to do whatever I wanted to do. I wasn't signed right. to one company. So you could freelance. Uh, so I freelanced, and I I did the way we were. We'll get to that in a minute. But uh, uh, in any event, th it was great because. My tastes and my partner's tastes, who was Bob Krasnow, Bob ended up becoming chairman of Electra. And um, he's a, just a great, great ears, great, great record guy, man, just the best. 
And we, but we had a difficulty because we were a small company, and every time we had something that even smelled of a hit, you know, we started selling some records, the major companies would come along and they'd offer the, the artist a million bucks and they'd find a way to get out of the contract. You know? Right. There's always, there'd always be a clause. Uh, so, um, you know, we did this for like four or five years and we had a ball. It was great. But at one point we just said, hey, look, we, we had an offer to sell the company and we sold it to ABC. ABC, yeah. And, uh, and then I went to work for Warner's. By this time, Lenny Warnker, who was my friend, had become like head of A&R. So he hired me. And then my friend, or my partner, Bob Krasnow, about six months later, he joined as a talent scout. And that's when things started popping. Yeah. So um, tell me a little bit more about this Blue Thumb experience. And I'm curious, you mentioned how part of your style of making records is that you're in the room with the artist. You're talking with the artist. Um, what, what else is some of the, could you characterize your sound of a Tommy LaPuma record? Did you already have a style by then? I, I think I had a style as to how I made records, or at least I was starting to, you know, sort of, let's say, acquire a style of sorts. But um, I'll never forget, I, I, I don't know, I'm trying to think of the director, whether it was Kubrick or... Um, Someone was, one of these directors was asked, uh, tell me, what, what, when, you, when you're working with like, you know, um, Kirk Douglas or whoever, you know, the person is, what do, you, what do you do when you're working with him? And his answer was, stay out of the way. <laughs> you know, and the thing is, it's like, you know, I would always, man, I, it, I would always have the best rhythm section. You know, like the rhythm section was, the whole deal, starting with the drums. I mean, if you, you know, if a drummer, if if you didn't have a great drummer, it didn't matter. I don't care what you did. I don't care what you know. It just you had to have someone, you know. And and having, and guys I worked with, you know, in those days from uh, 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 the guy from the Wrecking Crew, whose name right now uh, evades Hal me. Hal Blaine. Thank you, Hal, and uh, 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 Jim Gordon, and uh, Keltner, and uh, 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 they were creative guys, man, and they were musical. They were musical, you know. It's uh, drummers, man. They gotta be musical. And and the other thing that uh, that was important, and I learned this from Harry James, believe it or not, something Harry James said, and he was absolutely on the money. He said the most. He said you can lose a hit record by not having the right tempo. Really. So, and and I, I think the cat was right. I mean, he was like, if you, you know, you gotta be so. Like, uh, and I'm not saying this is like a. <laughs> knocking the musicians as a, I, I don't want to make a generalization but a lot of times musicians have a tendency to like start you know they'll, they'll count off and they'll count off fast usually faster or just particularly in the live stuff yeah but you got to just stop for a minute and you say wait a minute let, let, let's let's find the groove you got to find the groove like where does this feel where does this song feel the best and it could be just a point or two, one way or the other, man. And it's just waiting. You just what I usually do is I just try to think about it. I sing it to myself. I get to a point where I find, I find, you know, I find it, and then I'll say, let's try it here. And I find that, like, you know, tempos are so important to ultimately what ends up how the artist, whether it's a vocalist or, or otherwise, plays it or sings it. Uh, how everybody approaches it. Um, so I'm very conscious of tempos, uh, and then it's the material you pick. Like, look, if you get a if you get a bunch of great players in a room, and you give them great material, that's where the Kubrick lines stay, just get out of the way, because you know they're good, they're creative enough where they're going to come up with. Things like you know, I worked a lot, forty years with with Joe Sample, who was the keyboard player with the Crusaders. Guy was a master, at he was the best. I was just telling this gentleman over here about he was the best <coughs> accompanist. He knew how to comp, which is the term they use. He knew how to comp a vocalist better than anyone I knew. Reason being, 
he would listen. Like, as I mentioned to him, you know, one what of my a What a concept. What a concept, Yeah, right? Listen. Yeah. But the interesting thing is, then we were talking about someone who, who, who uh, I'm sorry, man. What, what, what Jean Perla. Jean, Jean, Jean Perla. I'm sorry, man. Well, they just we met 10 minutes Jean, ago. Yeah. And, and, and uh, he mentioned that he had, he had worked with Herbie Hancock. Now, I, man, I, I love Herbie Hancock. He's fantastic. And I love the way he plays. But he's not actually the best person to have as somebody to back up a singer. Because, and where I, I finally came to the conclusion on this is I had him on a Natalie Cole date, and uh, uh, we were doing this, this old Aretha Franklin thing called Take a Look. And she's singing, and he's playing his ass off, man. And, and, I'm, and I find I'm getting drawn to what he's playing because he's playing so beautifully, you know? And then I found at one point, just to put with the rough mixes, I had more piano up than I had vocal. And I'm saying, wait a minute, man, there's something wrong. I said, He's just, he's playing too much. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not that he was playing badly too much, but... In fact, the opposite, this he was, was not, playing... It was not the Herbie Hancock show or, or record. Right. It was Natalie's record, you know? So it's important that you get guys, and Joe being one of the masters of that, where he listens to what the artist is doing. And, and the other thing he did is he knew how to set up a song. It's important. I mean, whether or not you do, you know, an arranger... You know, there's something I want to preface here that I think is very important. I'm talking about all these things. I have no idea what kind of music that you're into or what it is that you produce. I can only talk about the type of things that I do. And it's not that I only do standards or I do, but I have to have some sort of structure, meaning I melodically, and a song with a lyric has got to tell a story. I mean, it's not, you know, like everybody, you know, somebody says, oh, I just wrote this tune. Well, that's great. But, you know, I, I, I listen to the, the tune, and, and I, I get to the end, I go, what did he say? What, what, what are they talking about? You, you know, if, if the lyrics don't hit a poignant, you know, if you don't feel something when you hear the lyrics, and the beauty and reason why all these great jazz players played these standards is because... The melodies were great. The changes, you know, were great. That's why they played this shit. They didn't play it just because, you know, oh, I think I'll play standards. They played it because they were great songs. Yeah, and you, you know, sounded they, good playing them. Now, I'm not saying suddenly that, like, you know, uh, uh, contemporary <coughs> artists should start writing like they Forget it, man. It's like that's then, this is now, and time doesn't go backwards, you know. But when, whenever you, whatever it is I'm talking about, I'm talking about the music that not only I did or music that I'm attracted to. I'm not particularly attracted to hip hop, even though the Salt and Pepper and it was in their day, I thought were great. Uh, 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 you know, there were there were certain like, you know, uh, uh, what's his name again? The Master Master uh, Flash. Is that Master? Uh, Grandmaster Flash. Grandmaster Flash. First time I heard that record, I thought, wow, man, this is a great record. So it's not like it, I'm not, you know, there are certain things, but I got to have some sort of story and melody to, to things, you know? It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to sound like George Gershwin, it doesn't have to sound like Cole Porter, but there's got to be some sort of structured thing that grabs my attention. And then, if the lyrics are good, then then you hit the jackpot, you know. Um, all right, I just wanted to make that clear because, like, you know, I'm talking stuff here, and you're saying, "Well, hey, it's got nothing to do with what I'm doing." Right. But those things are kind of universal, no? Well, maybe not really. No. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm trying to, like, you know, listen. There are some artists out there like there's this kid there's a kid that I'm talking to right now who lives in England his name is Jacob Collier okay this guy people is know out, Jacob this guy is outrageous he's 19 years old he will literally he will scare the shit out of you with his with his voicings he does a version of fascinating rhythm that, that like I mean you got to stop I got to put it on pause and say wait a minute what, what did he just do man I have to go back I got to hear it again because what does he the play? voicings, he plays everything. 
He, play, he, be, he sings like a bird. You know, he sings like all the parts. He plays bass, great. He plays keyboards, he plays drums. And he puts all these things together, you know? The two things, the first thing I heard that he did was um, uh, from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Uh, uh, Pure, imagination. Pure Imagination, thank you. And uh, that, that blew me away, you know? And, and, and then he did a, a, a Stevie Wonder tune, Isn't She Wonderful, Isn't she, uh, which was, Don't You Worry About a Thing, right, that was yeah. another one. But, uh, but fascinating rhythm just blew me away. Okay, so you got kids like that, which makes me feel there's hope. I'm sorry, his name is Jacob. Jacob Collier? Collier. Collier. C-O-L-L-I-E-R, So look, yeah. look for that. So, I mean, can you think you're going to produce something with him? Well, I'm, gonna, I'm definitely doing something with him. I'm working, I'm, I'm working on, on, uh, with, with an instrumentalist, and I'm thinking about using him on a few tunes. I found this great tune uh, uh, that is sort of obscure that he loved. And, you know, so we're going to, yeah, so he's going to do a few things. But then I'm going to, the rest of the stuff I'm going to have, you know, Steve Gadd, Christian McBride. Uh, uh, yeah, not too shabby, right? Yeah. <laughs> Speaking uh, of the And Larry section. Golding's on keyboard. You know, Larry Golding's is a new school jazz alum. Oh, really? Yep. I didn't know that. Yep. He's one of our. Yeah, one I of just ours. spoke to Larry. He's in England, yeah. actually. He's with James, right? James Taylor right now. So, uh, I mean, you have such an uh, amazing uh, record as a, as a talent scout, someone who hears and, and, and has, has cultivated great artists like Diana Krall, like uh, reviving the career of little Jimmy Scott and even reviving the recording career of somebody like a Miles Davis with Tutu and records like that, uh, and uh, George Benson, another amazing artist. What is it that you hear when you hear a great... How do you know when you hear a great artist? Usually, the, the one thing, like if somebody plays me a demo and I go, wow, that's great. The first thing I want to do is I want to hear them, uh, I want to hear them in person. I want to hear them live. Because that's when you can really tell. I mean, you know, there's so many things you can do today with improving, you know, auto tune and all this crap that, you know, you, I want to hear them in person. I want to hear what they sound like when they're just up on the stage. And, you know, you get that chill factor where suddenly you go, whoa, there's something going on here. So, and it's got to do, here's the other thing, and there's a reason for what I'm going to say, is that the one thing that is, I find so lacking today is style. And what I mean by that is, back, you know, I was fortunate enough to be born, I was born in 1936. So I, I was able to, I had all this great music happening around me from Duke Ellington and Count Basie and Scott, you know, all, all these. But it's like, you know, when you heard Ben Webster, man, you knew, you knew it was Ben Webster. It wasn't like, you know, you heard Zoot Sims, man, you knew it was Zoot Sims. It, it didn't, it, you didn't have to scratch your head and say, oh, yeah, who could this be? Or Stan Getz, you knew who it was. Today, man, you know, you hear alto players, they all sound like David Sanborn or, you know. <laughs> it's like nobody's got any style of their own, man. It's like, and there's nothing wrong with learning from these cats, but it's like at one point you're gonna say, well, I wanna find a style of my own, something that I can be identified with, that somebody will say, hey, that's so-and-so. Their signature. Now, their signature. Now, one of the things that have changed in today's world that was different then is that you had all of these, I'll, call, I'll refer to them as laboratories. You know, you had 52nd Street, man. You had, you had all these clubs and guys playing and going and doing jam sessions afterwards. And so they had a chance to like rub sh shoulders with each other. And then they were all trying to like, there was a sort of a friendly, not it wasn't always friendly, but friendly competition where they're saying, man, I gotta, this guy's great. I gotta do something that's better than him or I have to do something that's different than him. Or, right. There's a great documentary that you must see called Keep On Keeping On. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's, the, it's a documentary on um, Clark, Terry. Uh, Clark Terry. Just came out. It's just it's fantastic. And he, he talks about, you know, he, because he played with Basie, then he played with Duke Ellington. But th these were like schools or laboratories for these, for these guys because they came up, you know, they came up 
in the, they had a thing called the Chitlin Circuit where, you know, you, there are clubs and you just play. And these, that's what these guys did. They played and they practiced and they, and they got styles of their own. Today, it's like you have schools, you know, like the new school, you've got a, a thousand schools putting out all of these talented musicians that have all of this knowledge, but practically, you know, the practicality, what is it? Where do they have a chance to take all of this knowledge and put it to some use, practical use? How do they play enough, or what are they, how do they do enough of it where they, they do come up with a style of their own? They find their own sound. Yeah. So, uh, that, I mean, it's fascinating. Let, so, and then you move to, uh, to Warner Brothers, and this is where really, I think, you started to really hit your stride as a producer. Mm -hmm. T tell us about, uh, I think, the f what was the biggest uh, record that, the first one for Warner Brothers, was it, uh, it was George? A, uh, George Benson, yeah. And you heard, had heard George Benson playing with brother Jack McDuff yeah. first, right? And Years I, before, I, you didn't even know who he was. I didn't even know who he was. I, all I knew was, uh, I mean, I knew he had this drummer, man, who was just outrageous. I uh, 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 can't remember his Joe name Dukes. now. Joe, thank Joe, you. Joe Dukes. Joe Dukes, man, and I, I was just so, I couldn't believe this guy, because he, he actually played on a bicycle, he sat on a bicycle seat. His tongue was always sticking out. Uh, yeah, right, right. His tongue was always sticking out, and on a was, bicycle he, seat. And they were playing it. <laughs> Drummers, try that for a for, for They were a gimmick. playing a jazz workshop in San Francisco, and then at those days, this is like 63, something like that, PSA had just started, PSA was a, an airline that was out in California, Center? No, 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 not that so, PSA. No, no, no. So P <laughs> P P PSA had just started this thing from L.A. to San Francisco, and it was twelve dollars uh, uh, each way. So it was like twenty-four for twenty-four dollars. I was able to get on a plane and go to San Francisco, <laughs> and I had. Yeah, that doesn't buy you a round of drinks in a I bar, man. You, you know Jeez. that that and, and, and they give you a cup of bullion to. Uh, to go with that tour bus. <laughs> Round trip and a cup of soup. So, uh, but I had friends, this disc jockey friend of mine who I was telling you about who taught me, he was my mentor, man. He, he, he was the music, his name was Bobby Dale, and he turned my whole head around as far as listening. But I mean, there were a few, as I could think about it, probably the first thing that turned my head around was Birth of the Cool. I think when I heard Birth of the Cool, back, you know, in the early 50s. I think that, that record probably turned my head around as to what, what I was listening to and then compare it to anything else that I was listening to. Well, what did Bobby Dale do? Because I read somewhere you said that at that time when you, when you first encountered Bobby, you were really much a jazz purist, let's say. I was I was a I was You're a, a jazz what I called, police. I was the part of the jazz police, you know. I didn't I thought rock and roll was just, you know, to jive and and uh, I I just, you know, I was a complete jazz nut and um he was but he knew every, he knew every jazz record. He was just a complete but a complete jazz freak, but he loved pop music. He loved all kinds of music. And that was the the guy who taught me that like you know, and basically Duke Ellington had said it. Right. There's only two kinds of music, good and, and bad. bad. Yeah. Uh, uh, and to, suddenly I was listening to, you know, one minute we were listening to uh, uh, Debussy and the next minute we were listening to James Brown, you know. It, so it was just great. And he was the first one who basically, he put a Chuck Berry record on. And he said... When was this that he put, this do you like remember? This was like 1961. Okay. He said, listen to these lyrics. And I, you know, started listening and I realized that the cat, I think it was Lucille, I think he was talking, he was talking about a car. Yeah. But, and I thought, man, this guy's a poet. You know, he's, he's, po you know, he's really, he's saying something here and on top of it, he basically got his, you know, I found out later that it was, uh, was it uh, uh, Thor, who, who's a great woman guitarist who, uh, Oh, I think Sister, uh, Sister Rosetta? Rosetta Thorpe, Thorpe man. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think that's where, where Chuck Berry got a, got a lot of his stuff. Was who from, knew? From her. She, she was outrageous. But 
that was the first time it sort of opened my mind. I said, wait a minute, I gotta, I gotta, li I just have to listen, not be, just shut things out. And I think one of the problems with a lot of, I wanna generalize again, but with a lot of jazz purists uh, uh, is that they don't open their minds to other things, you know? There, there's, there's more to life than just one genre. I mean, they're, they're like cheating themselves. It's like, you know, there's so many great things to listen to, you know? Uh, I mean, the first time, I'll never forget Bobby, uh, uh, Bobby this Bobby Dale. He used to, he worked the all night sh show and, and, and he was a close friend and I, you know, I'd give him a key to my house. By that time, I, was, I had enough bread to buy a, a little house in Studio City in LA. And uh, <laughs> he, Walked in when it was like, I don't know, 7 o'clock in the morning or something like that, and he wakes me up. And he used to call me Scooter. You know, he said, Scooter, man, Scooter. come on, get up. And, uh, <laughs> you know, he stuffs a pipe in my mouth, man, and, you know, it's like, you know I'm like in my, my den, <laughs> and he throws sex, he puts sex machine on. James Brown. And I mean, for the next two hours, man, that's all we did was listen to this thing over and over again. Take it to the bridge, take it to the bridge, man, you know. <laughs> and it, you started, that's when I started getting a sense of, because you know, James Brown was the cat about the groove. Yes. He was, and the other teacher for me in that area was Joe Sample. It was all about the groove with Joe. So let's go back to this, uh, this discovery George of George. Yeah. So I heard him in 1963 with Jack McDuff. And, uh, but then what happened was between 63 and when I signed him in 76 at Warner's, uh, I'd started getting these records. First, there was, a, there was a record on Verve that Herbie played on. In fact, he played a brilliant, Herbie played a brilliant solo on What's New. It's from the first George Benson album on, on, on Verve. And, uh, um, but then he came out, then, then Creed started a, a CTI. But he had like, he had a, a, a record called, uh, 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 what the hell was it called? White Not, Rabbit? White Rabbit. He had uh, uh, The Other Side of Abbey Road. And, and I just said, man, this guy is a monster. I mean, he could play, but some way or other, and even uh, The Other Side of Abbey Road, I missed, because he did sing one song in there. He's, he, he, he sang, Here Comes the Sun, but I, for some reason or other, I missed it. And, but I didn't hear any of his records on Columbia, where he had sung some things. So I didn't really know he could sing, but I knew he could play. So one night, <clears throat> around 1973, I was in San Francisco doing a record with uh, this Dan Hicks, uh, Dan Hicks and the Hot Licks. And I was with my friend and engineer, Al Schmidt, great engineer. <clears throat> and uh, he was working with the Jefferson Airplane, and I was doing this Dan Hicks record, and we were splitting a, a hotel room. And uh, so we were coming back from dinner, and we were going by this club called the Keystone Corner, and it said, George Benson. I said, man, stop the cab, man. We've got to get out. We've got to check this out. We went in. The first song that he, he did was Summertime. He sang Summertime. And I said, man, this guy, he can sing. So to show you how you never know what's going to be the key thing that ends up bringing artist and producer together. Three or four years, three years, just in 76, I had my first meeting with George Benson. And, you know, just talk, was breaking the ice and stuff. I said, uh, how come you don't sing on, on your records? He said, well, he said, Creed is trying to, you know, make me the next West Montgomery and... Uh, um, you know, he's not that interested in, the, in, in, in my vocals. I said, man, I said, I heard you about three years ago at the Keystone Corner. I said, man, you can really sing. I said, I, I, you know, I think you should sing more on your records. Well, about two years later, after we had had, you know, a couple of three or four or five million sellers, he, we were having dinner one night, and he got me the corner corner. He said, he said, brother, he said, you don't know this, but he said, remember when we first got together and you said, how come you don't sing? He said, that's when I knew I wanted you as my producer. So I, who, who knows that? It's just, that's how 
things happen, you know, things are moving all the time. That happened to be the key thing that I said, not knowing. And then what happened was when we got together, we started putting the material together. Uh, so I did had, you bring songs to him? or I, I, I picked everything. Other than uh, Phil Upchurch wrote this thing called Six to Four, which was on the, the, the Breezen album. I had done an album with, uh, with uh, uh, Gabor Zabo, which was, he was a great guitar player. Uh, but I had I brought in a very weird, but it was a great mixture. It was I put Gabor and Bobby Womack together. Wow, cool! And Bobby had written this tune, and of course, Gabor wasn't that interested in it. And, and truthfully, ne neither was George, because basically, it was just a a ma it was do re mi fa sol la ti do, you know, it was basically what it was. And uh, but there was something about the tune that not only did I do it with the Gabor, but I remembered it and I wanted to do it with George. So I talked him into doing it, along with some other things. But what happened was I had, uh, uh, I had Bobby Womack come to the date. And Bobby was so out of tune. I mean, it was like he had rubber bands on his guitar, man. It was just so out of tune, I couldn't believe it. So fortunately, I had him you know, isolated enough where I, I didn't get leakage. And, uh, but, so the, what I ended up doing was putting Phil Upchurch, who was just, uh, you know, extraordinary, gu guitar player extraordinary and bass player extraordinary. In fact, I replaced all the bass parts with Phil playing bass, and I put Phil playing rhythm guitar on all the stuff. But on this that is on, tune, This is on Breezen. Well, this is on the whole album. The whole but album. But Breezen was the first thing. And what happened was, though, Womack played... One thing that stuck out, I said, we gotta, we gotta incorporate this. And, and that was, and, and, and that's what I had, well, Phil ended up figuring, he'll make it the bass line. And that was bump, ba do ba de dump, dump, ba do ba do dump. Bobby Womack had played that, as out of tune as he was. And I said, we, we gotta that's save that. That's a keeper. So he played, so Phil ended up playing that as the bass line. And then Phil came up with a hook. Phil was the one who came up with So, you know, he put that on and then basically next thing you know we started having this groove. It was, you know, it was it was happening. Well, but then of course the next tune we did what I had heard this tune on a Leon Russell album called Carney was the title of the album. It was called this masquerade, and it, and the way Leon did it, it was like he started off. He had put his voice through a graphic equalizer and made it sound like he was talking on the phone or something for the first four bars or six bars, and he sort of lost the magic of what the tune was. The tune was great, so we we rehearsed a couple of days, so we had it down. Pre-production again. Again, pre-production, and it turns out that in that album of six tunes. Five of the six tunes were first takes. Wow. Unbelievable. And, and, and Mask of this Masquerade was first take. How many records did Breezen go on to sell? I think it's uh, 12 yeah. million. It's probably 12, 12 million. million. Uh, but, <laughs> wow. You know, uh, but, you know, it's like, and, oh, the other thing we did was I had changed studios. I had gone, I started using Capital Studio A, and the reason was because I loved big rooms with high ceilings because i you know al was such a, is, su is such a great engineer and he would like put a couple of ambient mics up you know above like you know these would be 20 foot ceilings 25 foot ceilings <clears throat> and he would put a few mics up there and just you know when we mix or even before we mixed he just put up enough of the ambience so you'd get the sense of the the room. It, it, it breathed. It gave the music a chance to breathe. A little bit the Rudy Van Gelder so type of... Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and I always, I always try to use studios that have high ceilings. So this is part of the secret of the Tommy LaPuma well, sound, well, maybe? You know, I, that could be part, yeah, because, you know, it, it just gives, it gives the, the music a chance to breathe. So, um, so when you you talk about how you work so closely with George and you you suggested tunes, 
How, how, as a producer, how do you get the artist to do what you want that you think as a producer is going to make the take successful without, you know, well, a lot of bossing times, the artist around or making a tension? A lot of times artists, you know, for, for, the, for good reason, which is it's very subjective to them. They're listening basically what they're doing, either what they're singing, what they're playing, whatever. And I'm listening to the big picture. And, and I'm interested in whether or not I, it's that magic take. You know, that's all I'm looking for, man. I'm looking for that take that it just does it, you know? Okay, and when that happens, sometimes you'll agree. Sometimes everybody will agree. And sometimes they won't. They say, oh, man, let's take one more. Because, you know, the, the, I didn't like the way I did the, you know, the, I, didn't, I don't like the way my performance was in the bridge or whatever they'd come up with things. Well, I would just say, okay, look, I think this is a great take. You want to take another one? Great. Let's, let's take another one. And we'd take, you know, sometimes we'd take one, sometimes two, sometimes ten, you know. But I always remembered that take. Now, I'm not going to say that there isn't a time when we did do another one and suddenly it was better than the one. But for the most part, you'd, <laughs> yo, guys. <laughs> So, so, uh, but for the most part, you know, you would, you would, um, uh, um, when that moment happened, you would know it. In other words, everybody in the room reached this place at the same time, you know, and and it's like a gig, like a live gig, you know. Some nights you, you're playing your ass off, and some nights it just is not there, you know. Yeah. And the same thing with takes. And the other thing is, it's like you know. Musicians, went, especially great musicians like that, and you don't always, I don't have arrangements. Unless we do a, a live orchestra date or a live big band date, all I have usually is a chord chart. And, but guys, you know, like whether if I have Joe or whoever it is, they'll come up with something, they'll set the tune up for the intro and whatnot. Next thing you know, things start coming together. Well, if you went back two hours later and say, hey, can we do that again? They didn't remember anything they played because yep. it was that spontaneous, you know? Right. But that's what I'm, I'm, spontaneity is the deal. You know, that's what makes these things aside. I will give you an example, and I won't mention the artist, but, but a, a vocalist, big, huge vocalist, who I've done a few albums with. She has the ability to be able to wring out every bit of feeling because what she does is she starts saying, well, can we, I, let's, I want to replace like the word like. Or how about can we just get the didn't of the didn't? I'm not kidding, man. I mean, it would be down to like half of a word or whatever. Let's take this from there and take this part from there and okay and then she put it all together and she go oh doesn't that sound great yeah but it does it sounds like shit because there's no feeling she took everything out of it you know it's not spontaneous there's nothing like dynamics and just a moment when everybody hits that place at the same time you know so is that part of the producer's job to create well you cry, the, the, the potential they, for well, that for moment one thing i don't allow, i don't allow not on their, they have them on their wrist. I don't tell them to take it off. But I don't like, you know, clocks in the room. Uh, 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 I, and and I book usually when I book, usually I do book musicians for uh, rhythm tracks. I'll book them for a day. I'll pay them for a day, and then usually we'll start somewhere around noon, twelve thirty, and we'll go usually until you know seven or eight, and sometimes we'll go till nine or whatever. But I just and. I, I don't want to have like one three-hour date and then I'm pressured. We got to be thinking, oh man, we got to finish or we got to do this in a certain amount of time. We got the day, and usually what I do is I hire them for the day, and then I I do like three days, maybe four days in a row. And so they get a thing going together. Well, chemistry. that and also it's like we walk in. We may spend the first hour just bullshitting, you know, just talking about hey, what's, what's going on and what's happening. Whatever, and, and at one point, you know, I'll sort of diplomatically 
put them in a place of saying, well, hey, let's, let's try this first tune or whatever. And then, you know, maybe after we do the first tune, it's just around time to have some lunch. I say, hey, man, let's, let's order lunch now so by the time we finish this, lunch will be here, you know? And, and we'll take a break, you know, and then we'll go back and we'll start again. But there's no, nobody's watching the clock and, and there's, it, 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 we have all the time in the world, in a sense, to let make this happen. And I've got a group of tunes, 10 tunes, 12 tunes, that I want to do over a three to five day period. And um, sometimes, man, we'll do, it'll take us two days to do 10 tunes, you know? Because it's just happening. It just happens, you know? And then sometimes it'll take longer. So how much of it is putting the right team together, the right musicians with that's, the right material and the... That's, uh, you know, a big part of, of the gig, getting the right players for the right, for the thing you're doing. Mm -hmm. I, that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, you, you use the same rhythm section every time, though I do use there's certain players, like, I try to get Christian as much as I can. Christian McBride. Yeah, because he, with, you know, an up, playing upright, he can go anywhere with it, you know. He's not, like, just locked into one feel one or one feel. exactly yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, you know keyboard players man like Larry I love Larry Goldings you know there there're a few guys but it's not like I have a a stable of people that I go through and 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 and, and can pick from right i try to figure out what it is I, what what is what am i trying to accomplish what are what is the material who would i think would be the best to accomplish this? Well, one of the stories that I love is uh, uh, for the, the recent Paul McCartney record that you did, uh, choosing to bring in Diana Crawl to, to play piano, not to sing. Right. Well, when we first started getting together, I, I went, I spent, I spent a week with him uh, in East Sussex, which was where, where he spends most of his time. With Paul. Yeah. And, uh, Sir Paul. Sir Paul. <laughs> and, you know, this was like something, he, this was sort of new, a new, not like he didn't know standards. And this is interesting because you listen to some of his tunes, he's one of the few, for lack of a better way of putting it, contemporary writers who sort of wrote some of his t tunes, he, he would write like a standard usually has what they refer to as a verse, which you very seldom hear, you know. You always hear it, you know, starting from letter A, it's stardust, whatever it is. But there's, there's like, you know, a part of that tune that starts it, which is the, they refer to as the verse. And I love verses, man. I, always, I try to always put in that introduction, verse, whatever you want to call it. And, uh, and you listen to Paul's things, to lead a better life. You know, he'd always write, he sort of wrote, his structure was kind of like standards. And it turns out, you know, his father was an amateur piano player. and they, So he knew standards. He didn't know all the standards. But whether or not he had the, the chops to sing these things, that was something else. <clears throat> so the first thing I wanted to do was see what if one, if two, and I think he was looking at the same time, if two, uh, what which tunes were go he was going to feel comfortable with? Yeah, because a lot of other people have done similar stuff. Rod Stewart's done standard uh, yeah, records, yeah. and I know, I know, but I'm just talking. I yeah, know. right. But, but I'm just right. talking marketplace. Right. So anyway, go ahead. So so uh, uh, I went. I must have gone there with like I don't know, forty tunes, fifty tunes. Yeah. And I brought uh, 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 this keyboard player with me. Uh, I can't believe it right now. I just went blank on his name. Uh, he's an Israeli. Yeah, by the way, uh, Tamir, 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 oh. sorry, that, no, I don't think it's Tamali, no. Yaniv, do you know? Did you say keyboard player? Keyboard player. Oh, yeah, it's a name you said. Oh. So, so uh, uh, but I, brought, I wanted someone who was going to be able to change keys, like, you know, because I was trying to find key, if we found the right thing. Right. And if I found, I felt good about it, and we were at his studio, I'd be able to, Get Same. it down on tape, and and this way I could bring it back with me. I could check it out and all that stuff. So, um, you know, 
and see which of the things worked, which didn't. But all I was worried about is not whether or not I had the right keyboard player for the project, but someone who can read. And if we wanted to go from, you know, from E flat to E, boom, he could do it. So Tamir was the guy. And I went there, and basically we went through 40 or 50 tunes. And when I left there, I wasn't sure whether or not this, we were going to be able to pull this off. There are a couple of things that he sounded okay on, but it, not, it wasn't that great. But then what happened was, excuse me, I found this tune that he owns, because he owns the Frank Lesser catalog. And it was from this uh, 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 show called Guys and Dolls. And it wasn't in the movie. It was in the show. I didn't see the show. I saw the movie. It was called More, More I Cannot uh, Wish You. And, uh, and I heard it. I thought, man, this is a beautiful tune. I played it for him, and he loved it. And then when we started the dates, by this time I had gotten maybe 18 things together that we were going to try that I felt there was a possibility. Good chance they would work. Right. Except the first thing we did was cheek to cheek, and it didn't. He was trying to sound like Fred Astaire, and it just Some didn't. Hey, yeah, 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 kind of it, thing. It, did, it wasn't happening. Yeah. So I, so I, I don't know how what do you tell me. How do you tell Paul McCartney it's not happening? Or did he know? <laughs> you know what? The guy is smart enough where he knows if it's happening or it's not happening. That's good. And I don't just say, hey, Paul, this ain't happening. Hey, this sucks. I just go, well, hey, let's, try, let's, let's put this aside for a minute. Let's try this. <laughs> and uh, I, I, so the second tune I picked and I thought, what am I going to do? And I thought, he sounded really good on more and more. I cannot wish him. And we did that. And that was the, was, that was the icebreaker. He, he did a lovely job on that. And... I think it gave him a little, it was a combination of confidence, and he found a place where he thought it made sense for his voice to be. Um, and uh, I mean, that's basically what happened there. Amazing. And that, you got a Grammy for that record, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> that, yeah, <laughs> round of applause. Do you want to go back and talk more about because we left it at sure. uh, George Benson, but I mean that's kind of, <laughs> in a way, still really early, early on. Tell us what. So after that was that is it fair to say that was your really first huge monster record, right? Right. And then, but actually, I had a not not a monster record, but I had a really good record I made with this kid, uh, this guy uh, Michael Franks. The Art of Tea. It's called The Art of Tea, and and Michael was a. Good writer. I mean, he was sort of in that Mose Allison kind yeah, of place. Yeah, very Mose. But it was really he was a unique writer, man. He he was, he didn't have a his style. His voice wasn't as sure about where to go as as Mose. But but he was a good writer. Um, and that was actually the first breakthrough record I, I, I had at Warner's. Meaning, it sold about three hundred thousand records, and it was you know. Those days, that, that was great. Yeah. And then George was the second record uh, uh, that I did. And then af after that, I mean, then I did it's Al Jarreau. Al Jarreau uh, and the, so Tom I did Jobim. Live, it turns out the live, yeah, I did Tom, uh, Tom uh, I was mentioning to your in-laws. Uh, yeah, my, my in-laws uh, born in Brazil are here. They're talking about that earlier. And uh, that was a guess. Working with Tom was, was just great. I met him through... Klaus Ogerman, who is my dear friend and a brilliant arranger. Um, and then he invited, he invited me to go to Brazil. And this was like, I don't know, 1977, something like that. And uh, so first time in Rio. Now, I had this idea of what Rio was like from hearing these records, you know, the girl from Ipanema. And, and I'll never forget, I, we... We landed at about six in the morning, right? And we land in this airport, and and Tom had somebody coming to get me who had a way to get through customs and all that stuff. Yeah. And all I was hearing is Lipuma, Lipuma. You know, it's like yeah, you're here, yeah. Well, the next thing I know, we get out in this traffic, man, and it was like bumper to bumper traffic. It was like Sea Caucus, New Jersey. On the, I couldn't believe it, man. With all, and then it was, and the fumes had that sweet smell to it. You know, it was like ethanol. 
Was it? No, I think it was maybe they sugar cane or something, yeah, whatever it was. Yeah. I know that. And then they ended up giving us a room right on the Copacabana. And you know, you'd open the window, and it was like the, the Copacabana, the, the 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 main street was going right through your living room, you know. <laughs> so, so we moved, we changed rooms, and so the second night we were there, he takes me to this. Um, uh, 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 he takes me to this. Uh, it was a. Uh, some one of these steak joints from uh, uh, the Argentinian uh, steak yeah. joints, right? Yeah, the Shirascaria. And I'll never forget, they, they served me and they gave me like three thin pieces of steak. I said, man, that's like, what is that? That's nothing. But what I did know was that they just kept bringing it. You know? <laughs> they kept bringing this meat. Okay, so in the meantime, Al Schmidt was with me. Al split because he was tired. And it was Tom and I. And Tom got very drunk. So at one point, you know, I said, hey, man, I, I want to get back. I'm tired. So he said, I'll drive you back. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. So, <laughs> so we get on, we get on, and it was, he, he, we end up on the, on, Copacabana, on the Copacabana, you know, right next to the beach. Yeah. And he's talking to me, and he's driving, and he's like going like this, man, <laughs> going through red lights, and he's going, oh, man, I can see myself. I'm going to be in the Brazilian jail. <laughs> Next thing I know, the red lights start. I go, oh, uh -oh. shit, this is it. Uh oh. They stopped. Cop comes to <coughs> the car. Tom puts the, puts the window down, and he starts speaking Portuguese to them, of course. Next thing I know, they get back in the car, and they gave us a police escort. They <laughs> gave us a police escort to my hotel, and then Escorted him. He lived in Leblon. I think Leblon, it was yeah. He lived in Leblon, so they took him home. <laughs> but you know, it didn't occur to me this guy was like, yeah, a hero. You know, he was like the well, they named the airport after him. Right. Absolutely. Uh, uh, <laughs> but he was great. But I, it turns out that I had a friend down there who I had signed at Blue Thumb, Joao Donato. Mm -hmm. Now this guy was fantastic. He was the great keyboard player and a wonderful writer. Wrote great songs. And so, uh, and I brought Michael Franks with me and we did some stuff, which was on the second Michael Franks album. Uh -huh. uh, uh, which uh, one was that? The uh, 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 Sleeping Gypsy. Right. And, uh, and I'll never forget, there was one studio in Rio. We go, we go there, turns out that they only had three reels of tape. It was, I don't know, it was either 16 or 24 tape, or tape or whatever it was. All they had was three reels, so we had to keep going over stuff. Like, you know, we'd get a take and we'd go, okay, great, just that, and now let's take that off, and then we'll use whatever's left for th three reels of tape. And then the other thing is, when we monitored, we could only monitor mono. I mean, it was so, it was, it was, it was so antiquated, but then this was the best part. It got to be like one o'clock in the morning. The manager of the studio would come in like two or three hours before that. And he said, listen, I'm gonna leave you with the second. He'll take care of you, don't worry about it, everything. And he, he splits. So about one o'clock, the second looks at his watch and he goes, hey, uh, I'm, I'm getting tired, I'm, I'm gonna go. So when you finish, <laughs> just, just close the door. the door behind you, you know? And we were there. <laughs> it was, what, what an experience, man, it was great. But, you know, I, I uh, I just had a fun, I had so much fun. The first thing you had to realize was that there is time. You have you have time, and then you have Brazilian time. Yes. So it would be like you know, he, Joao Palma, this drummer that I, that I knew. Joao said, "I'll pick you up in 20 minutes." I said, "Okay, great." <laughs> two hours later. So two literally two hours <laughs> later, man, and like, and you know, I was getting a little yeah. impatient, and at one point I realized, hey, you know, you just gotta like forget it, cool it. If it takes two hours, just get a book, read a book, whatever it is. Get a Kuiperine, yeah. Get a, yeah, whatever it is. <laughs> just don't, don't get uptight. This is the way it is. Amazing, amazing yeah. stories. So uh, I, I want to um, ask you about uh, one of the things that you're, and we're going to jump ahead and skip the timeline now, but one of the things that uh, you're most famous for is your relationship with uh, Diana Krall and the great series of records that you've, produced with her. Can you tell us a little bit about how all that came about and what it was like? What, wh how did you 
realize that she was going to be such a great artist? What was it about her? She, uh, I, when I first went to GRP, uh, and it's funny because like there was a big, uh, you know, how shall I put it? There was like a, a coup at Warner Brothers. And next thing you know, all of my friends were gone, like Mo Austin and everybody, they, they all resigned or got fired, however you want to look at it. And it turns out, thank God, my friend Bob Krasnow, who I was working with at Electra at the time, gave me this thing called a key man clause, which basically gave me the ability if he quit, died, or you know was no longer ahead of the company, I could leave. So when they let him go, I had the ability to leave. A friend of mine called me who was president of, he was actually chairman of, of, of Geffen at the time. His name was Eddie Rosenblatt. He said, hey, I just want to hip hip you to, you're going to get a call from somebody at Universal. They want you to take over and be president of GRP. Now, I had a lot of respect for Dave Grusin. I thought Grusin was great. And what year was this? This was 1994. Okay. And, but I, I, didn't, I wasn't that crazy about the music. It was sort of smooth jazz stuff. And, but I remember when he said, he said, uh, you know, they want to offer you the, uh, the, the, to head up uh, GRP. And I remember saying to my friend, I, I said, I would have been a lot more excited if you said Verve. Now, who knew that two years later, Universal bought Verve and I became head of Verve. But, uh, but I took the gig. That's okay, you can applaud. I took, <laughs> I took the gig and uh, uh, the first thing that came, uh, they actually had the, they'd gotten this tape and they were going to, they were thinking about signing this girl. But maybe they were, they were gonna sign her and they, they wanted me to hear her. So they put this record on, and I, the first I heard thing it was I, a cassette. Was it a cassette? No. It could have been a cassette. I, whatever it was, it was the, her first. It was the first record she had ever made, and it was on a small label called Just in Time, which was out of Canada. Yeah. And uh, and I listened to this, and it, it sounded like a like a Holiday Inn <laughs> band or something. You know, it just. I thought, man, I'm not hearing anything here. Thank God, I said, Do you have anything else? He said, "Well, we have this video she did for uh, for the um, um, what was it the B B T uh, what the hell is that channel uh, B E T channel B E T and uh, so they put this thing on and it was her singing body and soul just her and piano. Well, man, I, whew, I said, man, this this girl can sing. Which will tell you something else too. Don't ever you know you listen to something you got to hear someone live or hear someone." who you just catch in something like, like I was able to catch on this BET uh, tape. Uh, you can't go by the first thing because, was, I mean, I would have passed on her. Right. So then I got together with her and we did, the first album we did was direct a two track because it was, you know, we, we couldn't spin a lot of bread. Right. And I think it cost us like 15 grand to make it. And, uh, but we had like Stanley Turrentine on the date and it was, it was great, Ray Brown and, uh, uh, so, uh, and then it came out, and we did okay. I think we sold, I don't know, seventeen or eighteen thousand records. And it, it was cool. Good for a jazz but then what happened? Yeah, you know, it was it was it was okay. You know, so this so between that and the second album, uh, 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 one of the uh, bird brains who worked at the uh, uh, at, at GRP had come up with this idea. It was the twenty fifth anniversary of the Beatles, and he said, "Let's do an album with all Beatles songs." Doing it. I don't know about this, man. You know, I'm sure everybody's going to do it. Something. All right. So it turns out, they, you know, they said, "Oh, we want to do this. It's going to be great." I said, "All right, great." So I did, uh, and I love her. But it became I, and I love him, with Diana. But this time, of course, I went in, and all I had was a, was a, a, I had Christian McBride on, on bass, and I had Louis Nash on drums. And and what well, rhythm section? Was, it was it was great. But it was just the three of them and me, and we were in this small studio. It was the Sony studio on 53rd. And uh, it's Avatar now, isn't it? Isn't it? No, it's no? nothing now. It's a it's a condominium. Oh. <clears throat> so, uh, but we had time, and you, we just worked on getting something that made sense. You know, we just kept. No, that's not working. Let's do it this way. Let's try. Let's start with the you know intro only being. 
four bars, eight bar, on whatever we're doing. And one play, at one point, she just dropped this fantastic, they, but her scene, scene dropped this great performance. And I said, we got to listen to this, man. This is something. She said, really? I said, yeah. We went in, and I remember as we were listening back, she's checking this out, and I can just see the gears going, and I realized that she's got it, that if you spend time, you'll spend a little time getting a sense as how the best feel and tempo and structure and all that stuff, and you have the time to, to do it, whether it's an hour or two hours, whatever it takes to get to that point, that you're going to get to that point where suddenly you're going to drop a, uh, you know, some magic. And I think that it was worth, because the project was a disaster, but it was worth it just for that, because then she not only got confidence in being in the studio, because the first record she was so nervous and she didn't, you know, she, she had never really made a record with all these great people before, like Ray Brown. And so, uh, 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 so then we did All For You, which was a, a, a Nat Cole, all the Nat Cole tunes. And it was Russell Malone on guitar, who was great. <clears throat> I can't remember the bass player's name. Anyway, because it was just a trio. It was like a Nat Cole trio kind of thing. Just guitar, bass, and, and piano. By the time we got to the third record, which was still just a trio, she had come up with this great, I had picked a majority of the things on the album, but she had come up with Peel Me a Grape. And uh, man, it was just, it was a combination of Christian, Russell, and her. And man, I, we had broken through the barrier. The glass Everybody barrier. knew it? Well, it's not like we're saying, hey, this is going to be, but right. we sold like 100,000 records on it, but it just felt good. Yeah. Uh, uh, just knew that, and when she heard stuff back, you could tell she was just getting more confidence. Uh, so then, this, the, the fourth record we did, we, we, she loved Johnny, Man, Johnny Mandel, and Ma Mandel was a friend, and so I said, well, look, let me see if I can get, well, he loved her. He thought he had heard the third, or the, the second record we had made. And uh, so we, we got him to do, and it was, it was, uh, when I look in your eyes. And that sold two million. And that <clears throat> started it off. But then the third record, which you think, oh shit, you know, you got this winning combination, go back to it. I call Klaus. And to show this will give you a little idea how you have to be for a combination of diplomat and a few other things involved here. Klaus had gotten to the point, Klaus Ogerman had gotten to the point where he wanted to, he was writing piano concertos and stuff and he was afraid if he did any pop records that the classical police was not going to take, he wasn't going to take them seriously. So he said, Tommy, he said, I, I didn't ask him specifically about Diane at that point, but he said, Tommy, I, you know, I'd, I'd love to do something, but I'm just, I'm concerned about, so I said, hey, I, I get it, I get it. Okay, but in the meantime, he had written this piano concerto. He said it to me, and I said, hey, it's beautiful, man, it's lovely. He said, yeah, he said, I can't get this thing released. I'd love to get this released. And I started thinking. And I called Chris Roberts, who was running the classical division for UMG, and I had lunch with him. And I said, Chris, look, man, I will pay for it. But and he knew who Klaus Ogerman was. I said, I'll tell you what, man. I will pay for whatever it is to... to he, it, the album is not going to cost you anything. It's already made. He's going to give it to you. But I'll pay you for whatever it's going to cost you to put it out and put a, label, a, a cover on this and put 5,000 records out, 3,000 records, whatever you think. And Chris said, hey, man, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll take care of it. This is, we're all in this together. Uh, he was really a great guy, and he, he, he got it. So what I did was I called Klaus and I said, Klaus, I got great news, man. I had, uh, uh, I had lunch with Chris Roberts and I played him the record. And he loves the record and he's going to put it out. And he said, oh, that's fantastic, great. Now, I had talked to him about Diana, about doing something, and he was saying, well, I don't, you know, I'm just afraid. So he said, this is great, fantastic. And without me having to say a thing, he said, well, hey, when do you want to start that Diana record? <laughs> So, well you know, played. and that was the Look of Love album, and that did four million albums. Wow. 
so and look for every I mean it did it for all the right reasons it was really it was I think it was one of the best records we made so this yeah feel free to applaud that absolutely <laughs> you got a big you got a new fan Tommy so I, I, I'm curious this process that you described of you worked with Diana it, it didn't wasn't straight out the gate a big hit it went in fits and starts and you had to to work and actually develop an artist yep does this exist in today's recording industry I, the, the I potential for this I don't think so for a few reasons first of all record companies have gotten to the point where you know we used to have a department called artist development so like take for instance at Warner Brothers we signed Bonnie Raitt okay Bonnie did four albums with Warner's three or four albums and Bonnie was having some personal problems and she had she, she had trouble with drinking problem and all of that which she's she hasn't I don't think she's had a drop in 25 years but but they stuck with her for four albums you know and at one point they just said hey can't do this. And I think, though, that was the best thing that happened because when they dropped her, that she was like a sobering thing. experience yeah. for her. And literally, I think she sobered up and then she had luck of the draw. You know, it was like, yeah. I think it was luck of the no, draw. It that was the, the, no. Nick of Time? Well, Nick of Time. Nick of Time. Was, yeah. 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 Uh, which had uh, uh, one of my f most favorite songs in it. Uh, Turn down the mic. What the hell was the name of that tune? Let's give him the. Let's let's give him the no. Anybody know? Anybody know what the tune is? I can't make you love me if you won't. Uh, Outrageous song, you know. Uh, uh, but she, again, then talk about a natural. Yeah. This girl is a natural. So what are the? Uh, but we were describing, you know, what happened now that that record. Well, you can't because the, you know artists uh, today. You put out a record. <laughs> And if you don't start making noise in three weeks, man, they're around in the next one, you know? Yeah. There's no, there's no artist development. So, I mean, the whole industry has completely changed, so even though you're still making records, thank goodness. Totally changed. But, so, what's next for the uh, record industry? Do no you have idea. any idea? I have no idea, man. I don't okay. Know. We're I, not I, alone. I, 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 Nobody knows. Just, honest with you, I have, I have no idea. All I know is I'm an, optimi I'm an optimist by nature. So I would just imagine that like things go in cycles and at one point, now I don't mean that it's going to go back to, you know, cold port, as I said earlier, cold port or whatever. No. Right. But whatever it is, it's going to be something that's going to grab people's uh, uh, imagination, grab people's ear. And look, it's not like there aren't some great groups. I'll tell you a group, and I'll give this is a good example of, of, of what happens sometimes without a direction or if a band doesn't want to take a direction. There's a group called Dirty Loops. All right, now they play their butts off. But there are two things I, I, I when I listen to this band, there are two things I hear that I, I, I realize is happening here that could be inhibit, not inhibiting them, but hurt, not hurting their progress. One, uh, everything is, everything is up here, man. It's yeah. like bam, bam, bam. You know, and the tempo's like this, and it's like insane. It's like that. Hey, man, take a Valium or something. <laughs> just like take a chill pill. Cool, just cool. You know, cool <laughs> out, man. Just take. You know, you, there's other ways of doing this tune other than. You know, or like you, even like that. Just think about it for a minute. That seems to be one thing that's, that's lacking. The singer who's outrageous, he's got to find a little bit more of his own style. He's like sometimes when I hear him, I think he's just like he sounds like Stevie Wonder, man. There's like this Stevie Wonder thing about him, and he's, it's great. Look, the guy sings his ass off, but he doesn't. He's got you know they got to find their own niche. Uh, but you know. They're fantastic musicians. And, and like maybe, you know, as I'm thinking about it, I don't know if there's anybody who they have enough respect for or that, you know, who, that is giving them the right direction or trying to give them a sense as to what, you know, it is. Like when you, you know, if you see this Clark Terry thing that I was talk, talking about earlier. Keep on keeping on the movie. Yeah. I mean, one of the things he said was, one of the first things he learned, I think it was, 
from Duke Ellington, Ashley, was it Duke Ellington, who said to him, simplicity is what it's all about. It's like, you know, and like you gotta, you gotta just think about, you know, simplicity is, is so important. It's not, nobody, you're not gonna impress anybody with a thousand notes. Or, in fact, I'll give you a great line that Miles Davis gave me said to a musician, when I first started working with Miles, I went to a rehearsal and, and it was Mike, Mike Sturm, was a great, great guitar player. But, uh, uh, and Mike was playing, he was all over the place. Gets to the end of the song and Miles walked up to him and he said, man, I'm gonna send you to Notes Anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> Notes Anonymous. So he didn't have to say anything else, man, because that said it all. That's and he classic. Basically, yeah. Tell them, you know, yeah. it's like they don't have <laughs> to play always. every note in the scale. Yeah. Just, you know, and that was one of the things about Miles that was so great because Miles knew early on, he, he, he didn't have the, he didn't have the technique of Clifford Brown or, or, or Dizzy or Dizzy or, or Clark, even, yeah. you know. Yeah. But he knew how to play the blues. Yeah. And he just made the notes count. So play to your strengths. Play, yeah, right. Play to your strengths. So uh, this has been amazing. I mean, we've only scratched the surface. I mean, we could go on for many more hours talking about all the incredible artists you've worked with, but I want to make sure that we have time for people to ask some questions, and I hope we have some, some questions. Uh, let's start over here with Gene. Yeah, many years ago, Elliot Spitzer, and he busted the Uh -huh. Well, actually, as a song plugger, I mean, I didn't have to pay anybody to, to do it. Not that there weren't deals being made, meaning, hey, I'll give you part of the publishing if you do if you do the song. Right. There, were, there was all that stuff going on. But of course, listen, there used to be something called the fifty dollar handshake, you know, and basically that was it. Like you'd walk up to to a disc jockey or something. Hey, man, how you doing? You know, you put 50 bucks or 100 bucks, whatever. Well, that's how hand. they got Alan Freed, right? That's, that was his downfall. Well, that was, well, you know what? Alan, Alan took the, Alan took the, the fall for, for everybody. everybody. Yeah. Because it wasn't like he was, he was the only guy, guy that was taking, sure. taking payola. No, of course. But he was the biggest, so they jumped on him. You know, Dick Clark was no angel sure. in that area, but he just looked like one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Rory, and then I'll get to you, Alexis. So, so I know this is a kind of detailed question. I thought maybe to just address a particular date as an example, because it's probably different for every date. Mm -hmm. But there's so many decisions, like in George Benson Greasing, which, you know, should we do another take or are we done? Um, which of the tracks, which of the tunes we recorded should go on the on the final record? Um, what sequence, what order should they go in? Mm -hmm. Which take? You know, well, you don't come up with all of those things at the same time. And, mean, and, and are you usually, like, was that your decision or George's or your Well, you, listen, you always you want to give the artist a sense that he's part of the, because he is. I mean, <laughs> without the artist, man, you got nothing, you know. You might as well go back and cut hair, you know. It's like, <laughs> you got to, you know, without the artist, there's nothing. But it's like, it's the sense of how best to get the best performance. Okay, then you, you uh, I always, I usually overcut not by a lot, but let's say if I, you're gonna have 12 things on, on, a, on an album, you know, I'll, I'll try to do 15 things, so I got something to pick from. Uh, that's another thing. And then the last thing I'll do, and usually I don't even deal with it, sometimes I'll get an idea that, man, this would be a good opener. And sometimes I find that if I, if I find a good opener and a good closer, it's easier to start filling in the middle. But I usually wait until I'm mixing because I hear, in the mixing process, I'll hear this thing 30, 40 times just getting the right mix. Uh, uh, and, and the more you hear it, the more you get a sense of, wait, this, this may sound better here. Then I'll start just making some notes and I'll put the first, you know, what I think should open it, maybe what I think should close it, and I'll start filling in the holes. But then, once I get, I'll get the first, what I think is the sequence. And then I'll tell them to assemble it with that sequence. But then I gotta listen to it. And then when I listen to it, either you go, yeah, that's great, or you'll say, no, you know what, man, I, this is all wrong. Or you'll say, well, this is right, but 
this, this, maybe we should change this to that, whatever. And then you start making adjustments. I mean, I'm guessing it's different in each case. Right? Each case. But, but in a lot of cases, is the artist doing every single thing with, that you mentioned with you? Or are you kind of coming up with the sequence and a choice of tunes and then giving that to I'll, the I'll tell, I'll say to them, look, I came up with a sequence. I think, you know, I'd like you to hear it. Uh, but I always want them, not only do I want them to know, but I always make sure that I tell them, look, this is your album. It, you know, the bottom line is you paid for it, because they do. You know, as much as the record company may pay for it in front, but they pay for it. So the bottom line is this. I just have to tell you what I think. What, you know, and this, these are the reasons. It's always good to come up with reasons why you think it should be this way versus the other way. And then you hope that just some rationality will come into this where they'll see it or sometimes, man, you know, because look, God knows, I'm not always right, you know? I mean, sometimes they'll, they'll argue, they'll come up with something and I'll, I'll say, you know what? That makes sense, you're right. You can't, you know, it's not, you don't have all the answers. But things like these answers or these things that happen, they happen in the moment. It's not a question of like, you know, you can get prepared, you can do everything, but it's the moment and the ability to have a sense that you have a feeling of when that moment happens. You know, it's funny, man. I, every time I look at you, did anybody ever tell you you look a lot like Steve Jordan? Q. No, you. Me? Yeah. It's amazing, man. No, well, yeah, you you do. I mean, he doesn't have dreads, or, but 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 uh, <laughs> Steve Jordan to me is one of the great drummers. And let me tell you why I think Steve Jordan is a great, great, great drummer. Now, if, if you heard the John Mayer, uh, 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 it's the album that, that Steve did, which uh, uh, continue. All right, you listen to that album, and then you listen to things that John did before and John did after. Now, you know, unless you're deaf, you can tell. There's something about that. Okay, there's a lot of things about that. First of all, Steve's doing a lot of the background. Steve is one of the great producers. Really? Though he's an outrageous drummer. But when you listen to his drums, you know, you, you know these are the subtle things that like, you don't even think about. You take it for granted. You're listening. But Steve and, well, Steve Jordan, Steve Gadd, all the great drummers, they tune their drums. It's not like they just don't, you know, Somebody puts, they set up the drums in front of them, and they just sit down and they start playing, you know? I mean, they, they tune them, and they're always tuning them, you know? They, sometimes they'll tune them depending on the key you're in, you know? They, and that's, it's that, that's one of the things that they do that make, not only, when you hear that album, and you hear how the drums sound, man, they sound like, I, I, he's, the, he's brilliant. At, at how these drums sound. But all great drummers know how to make their instrument sound just, they, they, it sings. Drummers take note. And, and look, man, drummers, if you don't, I don't care how great anybody is, if, you, if the drums aren't right, forget it. It doesn't matter how great the song is, how great everybody else is, if the drums ain't happening, forget it. Do we have some more questions? Oh, sorry, Alexis. Uh, one of my favorite albums of all time is Doodoo. And when I was a young kid, I sort of bought the album. And I was just curious, because I know that at the time it was a very controversial album because of the political content of it, A, and B, because of people were, were trashing Miles for trying something new. Is that what you're He doing? always tried something new, man. Right. That, yeah. <laughs> You know, Miles, man, he would, first of all, he loved musicians, loved musicians. And if you played, if he loved the way you played, you could do no wrong. He never told you how to play, what to play, you know. He loved you. I'll never forget, like, his, I don't know, I think it was Mike Stern. I think that, that was John, uh, uh, who's the cat who came, uh, uh, who's the, Schofield. Schofield was after it, Stern, right, thank you. And, and uh, Schofield split to, to do his own thing or whatever it was, and he was, he was really in a 
uh, fix. And he said, man, you know, guitar player. And the only thing I, person I could think of was Robin Ford. So I said, man, you ought to check this guy out. This guy's great. And he, without, and this is what you call trust, without hearing him or whatever, he hired him. And uh, at, at the first gig was in New Orleans. And I was working on some other project. I was in L.A. And he called me. Miles called me about, I don't know, must have been 11.30 or midnight. And he said, Tommy, man, Robin, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> and he just, you know, that, that okay. So, but as far as 2-2, two -two, you know, it's funny. When I got offered Miles, and of course, man, I was a huge fan of Miles. I didn't like Bitches Brew. I was never a Bitches Brew fan. But uh, I basically got off at Kind of Blue. I thought Kind of Blue was like right at the top of the. Anyway, I heard, you know, you hear so many horror stories about this cat that I said, man, I don't know if I'm, you know, do I, do I want to, do I really want to do this? Why do I get involved in this? But I thought, Miles, how can I, you know? So I, I had this meeting with him, and, and we hit it off. And, uh, and I had a couple of things. I played him there. Something, I'd gotten something from, uh, from George Duke, and, uh, which ended up on the, on the album. It's called, it's called, not Yard, but what the hell was it called again? Thank you. Back. Backyard Ritual. So, uh, uh, and, and I played him that. He liked it. But then I thought, man, who am I going to put this guy with? What am I going to do here? And I had been working for several years with, uh, with Marcus Miller. And Marcus is a great writer. And he did, I mean, you know, I had a huge album with him, with, with, with uh, David Sanborn and Bob James. I had sold, I don't know, three million albums, whatever. Double Vision? Double Vision. So I knew he could write, so I thought, this is great, man. He can write some stuff. And, and it turns out that he had, he had worked with Miles, and uh, with Al Foster, I think it was. But, yeah. And, and uh, so I said to Miles, I said, look, man, I'm thinking about bringing Marcus into this thing. And he said, man, I love Marcus, man. I said, yeah, Marcus is great. So I called Marcus. Of course, you know, he wanted to do it. So I gave him a sense of that. I said, look, I don't have anything right now other than this. One thing that George Duke wrote back here, I sent it to him. All right, so then we hooked up. I flew him out to LA. Miles had a, a place out in uh, Malibu. So we worked at, at, at uh, 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 Capitol. But um, we spent the first day just putting the drum track together for 2 2. And, and it, Miles wasn't even there. I mean, we basically just put this thing together. And, and the whole trick with that was trying to get a drum machine to swing, or at least to try to get a sense of, a, a sense of swing, you know? And, uh, or at least that blues feel that, you know, we ended up with. And, uh, but, you know, worked on it, worked on it, and we got, we got, the drums where we liked it. And then Marcus put on the bass. And then he started putting on a few of the keyboard parts. Marcus played everything on that. Uh, and then Miles came in. And he loved what he heard. And then he started playing. And basically all we did was, because I, I you, you know, he's an impatient cat. He's one of these guys. He just, he just do something so many times. And then it, just bored him, and, and he'd go on to something else. So I said, "Look, man, let's just get, let's get as many takes as we can get down on him, and then we'll put it, we'll put something together between all these takes." So we put about five solo things down. But uh, okay, and then he was tired, and he, you know, he split, and then we spent half of the night just figuring out. What were we going to use to play the melody? You know, we took part from this this track and took it from that track, and put the melody together. And then, and tape it was tape. So it's place. We basically took the machine, the drum machines, and all that stuff, and we transferred, you know, to tape. And then we put on the bass and everything on the on tape. Uh, 
But then when we, you know, he played, I had never heard him quite play, and, and really it was that tune more than any other tune on the album. I never heard him get as close to playing to what he was playing, you know, early the days when I, I loved everything he did, you know. Uh, just some of the lines that he played, particularly at the end where, you, where, where Marcus repeated the melody and he was playing over the melody. And I remember going home that, we had been working, I don't know, 18 hours, whatever, 20 hours. I remember going home the, and I drove from Vine Street in LA and I played that thing over and over again. I drove all the way to the beach, Santa Monica, Honolulu Beach, and back to my hotel just listening to this thing. I kept saying, man, I can't believe that we got this performance out of him. Well, I mean, it was performance, but it was like on four or five different things and we had put it together, but still it was him, you know, and he loved it. So that really was the opening door. Um, Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Anybody have any other questions? Yeah. Go front. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, I'm curious about what platform you use most to listen to music. What platform do you use wow. to listen to music? This is a very interesting, interesting question because, you know, <clears throat> Fortunately, you know, I did well enough that, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to work to eat. So I only work on things now that I, that I enjoy doing. I, most of the time I was that way. I mean, I never, there are a couple of things I did because the money was too good, you know, but, but I, I, I'm at that point. All right, because, and the good thing about it is that with this, you know, with these formats now, Spotify and, uh, you know, forget it, man. No, no, you know, nobody gets paid anymore. I mean, I got, a, I got a royalty statement. Literally, it was this thick, right? And, and the like check, a phone book. And the check was for like $200 or something like that. You know, when I used to get royalty statements like that thick, you know, the royalty statement would be for like thousands of dollars. And, and, and that's something that's, at one point, is going to have to be fixed. And the reason it's going to have to be fixed is because all you, got, all you people out there, man, you've got to make a living. You know? You can't. And, and, and how are you going to make a living, man? If you, in other words, you're, you're creating, you're trying to do something, you come up with a hit, and you end up getting paid, you know, a, a, mil, a mil cent. Uh, you know, uh, uh, for for something, you know, somebody I heard, I, I heard where somebody who wrote this tune that got something like I don't know how many four million hits or whatever it was, some crazy number. And he got a check for like five hundred dollars. You know, you can't. This this has got to change. But as far as the format, the two things, well, one is in the that thing has got to change. The other is. The quality of the sound is the worst. I mean, it's just terrible, man. You put on a, an LP or you put on a CD, and then you go and you, and, and you listen to an MP3 or you listen to, to, to Spotify, it's terrible, man. It's horrible. I keep, I'm saying, man, I, what are they doing? Well, I know what they're doing. I found out what they're doing. What they're doing is in order to get as much music as they can, they literally take slivers of, of, of the music out of the, you know, the whole sense, the whole sonic uh, thing. They're taking slivers of it out. So they can compress. So they can compress, you know? So it's like, it's horrible. All right, I would hope that in time, that's gonna change. The two important things that they've gotta get to is paying people for, for their work, and two, getting the quality of the sound to where it should be. You know, you spend, I spend all my time trying to make things sound as great as they are, and then I hear it on this stuff, and it sounds like shit, it sounds terrible. All right, but the big plus factor is that, because at one point I just said, hey man, I'm not gonna beat them, I'm joining them, man. I'm just gonna, you know, get on this thing. Well, you know what it's like? Having Spotify 
or any one of these streaming companies. It's like having Tower Records or Virgin Records in your living room. You know, I don't care whether, and I've got a wide variety of things I love listening to. So one time I was listening, I, I wanted to hear Aldo Ciccolini, who's this wonderful key, keyboard, a classical keyboard player, who plays Vivaldi, who's wonderful, plays Vivaldi just beautifully. So boom, Aldo Ciccolini, bam, there's everything the guy did right there. You know, and then on the other side, I'm you know, looking for Ben Webster. Boom, oh, everything Ben Webster did. Oh man, how can you beat, you're not gonna beat that. It's one, they, they've won. And for, for the right reasons. It's like the fact that when you're on a phone with somebody and you got your computer in front of you and they say, hey man, I just heard Jacob Collier, or no, that may not be the best for Spotify, but through YouTube, even YouTube. And you go, what? how do you spell that? Boom, 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 you're doing that. By the time he gets through spelling it, you've got it. Now, it used to be that if you, you heard a record on the radio, you'd have to go to the record store. You go to the record store, and maybe when you got to the record store, they didn't have it. Then you had to order it, and you had to wait three days for it. And now you have it, and it's there in seconds. So that's brilliant. And at one point, you know, once they get the sound right, and once they start paying people what they should be getting, that, you know. Do you think that's going to happen? Well, not my lifetime. I don't, I mean, I could be wrong. But, you know, fortunately, I, you know, I would hope my grandkids are going to get paid. <laughs> Any other questions for... Okay, well, thank you so much. This has been, oh, you got, you got a question? It's not, it's that, it's that uh, truthfully, it's not about me. So the best setting, setting is not for me. Now, there may, as far as setting, I may try to set up the room and the atmosphere and all that stuff to what I think would be conducive to getting the best performances I can get. But beyond that, it's about, it's about the artist. And, 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 you know, listen, if the artist didn't have an ego, or if the artist didn't, ha you know, have some, didn't have those traits, uh, it, it wouldn't, it, it, you know, he wouldn't be an artist. And the only thing that you have to do is learn how to be sort of a Henry Kissinger, <laughs> and, you know, diplomatically, try to get the best out of them. And and uh, now that doesn't mean that you you want them. Did you you say yes to everything? Because that doesn't help them either. Great. So anyway, so uh, let's please give a warm, warm round of applause. Tommy LaPuma, thank you so much. It's really been awesome having you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. It was great being here. Phil, you, you, it was great. I love you. The right question is just great. <laughs>